Today is about collecting records. I want to talk to you about how to collect good records. Okay, so firstly, when you look at orthodontics, you have to understand that photography is very, very important. So some of you might already be doing great photography in your practice, and that's brilliant. But I do find that a lot of people are not taking photographs to an appropriate diagnostic level. And that even includes some experienced practitioners. And I think if we're going to start looking at orthodontic diagnoses, developing a problem list, number one, the photographs have to be fantastic. So um, we have in our BOSS course one, a photography workshop, as well in our in-office course, a photography workshop. So we've got here an example of someone's basic set of orthodontic records. So what I want you guys to start doing is start looking at, um, um, you know, just start looking at your patients, start to see them, just observe right now. So I want you to take pictures like this, you know, extra oral, frontal, at rest, unstrained lips. You don't want the lips closing, okay? Frontal, okay, smiling, okay? That's a basic frontal smile. Now make sure if you look at these photographs, have a look at the extra oral photographs. Can you see the two years? They're projecting equally. So we know we haven't taken a photo in this angle or that angle. It's actually projecting equally. So they're very symmetric photographs. Then we take a profile shot. Very important to take an unstrained um, and um, unstrained position as well and patient looking a natural head position. So you don't want their head tipped down, tipped up. It has to be natural head position. So I'm gonna ask a question and guys, can you use the chat to answer this? Um, does anyone here know how to get a patient in natural, natural head position? Can anyone answer that? How do we determine natural head position? So I'm going to give it a minute. If anyone knows the answer. Okay. So I haven't had any chat here. Maybe there's a delay, but I'm going to actually tell you the answer. So the best way to get someone in natural head position is get them to look with their eyes facing front forward and looking as far in the horizon as possible. So you tell them to sit upright, look as far ahead as possible, into the horizon. And that's probably the best way to get a natural head position. So make sure that your team or yourself, you train yourself to take every photograph in that position. When you look at occlusals, please make sure you flip the photographs vertically. So occlusals are taken with a mirror. And you can see here, we've got a lip retractor, we've got a mirror, look at the amount of extension, you know, beautifully taken, beautifully edited. The tongue is all the way out. We, we can see all the way to the seventh. So these are the kind of photographs we've got to get used to taking. So you need the right equipment, okay? Uh, buckle shots, you're coming at 90 degree angle to the canine and parallel to the floor. Please do not come from the front or too far back, okay? Again, frontal, occlusal plane parallel to the floor. So these kind of photographs are what you need. So that's the basic set. So I want you to start taking photographs of your patients. So let's go to the next slide. These are the models. Now, some of you might be doing digital models, and that's fine. If you do digital models, you can create photographs like this. Um, but if you're still taking your study models and they don't have proper bases, and you are just trying to occlude them and the teeth are chipping, it's probably not a great record. So try to start doing orthodontic study models and try to um, to kind of, if you're doing digital models, even better, because you can actually get photographs like this. Okay, this is the basic set of orthodontic records. You need those photographs that I just showed you digital models or study models, but with orthodontic um, trimming and bases. A lateral cephalogram, make sure it's an occlusion and natural head posture. Again, how do you tell natural head posture? The patient just looks as far into the horizon as possible. Sometimes people have a mirror in their practice and they ask the patient to look 
into their own eyes in the mirror. And that's again, natural head position. You can see the head's not tipped up, it's not tipped down, it's directly level. So this is actually a really good cephalometrics um, radiograph and a really beautiful panoramic radiograph. So before I go further and talk a lot about how we get this information and records, I want to get Tina here. So Tina, can you come back on? Thanks. Do you mind taking over and talking a bit about x-rays and Sinus's dental point of view, how to get good records when it comes to radiology? Sure, I can do that. I'll just load up my uh presentation so with orthodontic imaging first of all i'll start off a little bit with uh, with a little bit of information about myself uh at the moment i've been working as a radiographer i've just cracked the 10-year mark uh i've been working with synesis dental for around about six years Tina, uh, sorry, and, this slide show is not showing maybe turn your that? webcam off yeah turn your webcam off maybe yep yeah perfect Got it now? Yeah. Cool. So, sorry, I'll just bring this up. Okay, so I'm just going to hide my notes. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I've been working with Synesis Dental for around about six years. Um, we look to create a relationship between a dentist and medical radiologist so that we can provide a little bit of medical legal backup and also providing dentists with a little bit of information on the surrounding structures that support the dentition, the dentist treat. Um, we've also developed our own secure radi uh, radiology reporting software with our own dedicated uh, patient archival system and a dedicated team of radiographers, IT staff and office staff to support radiologists and dentists to provide you guys with reports. Um, we have been reporting for around about 50 sites. Now we're on to 60 and that's including Westmead Dental School. Um, we do offer private reporting for all dentists and um, if you're interested in any of these sorts of things if you have your own machines um, just let us know um, you can i'll put up my details later on in um, the chat function i'll move on to our 2d imaging now so uh, at the moment um, with OPGs, this is your basic imaging, providing you with an overview of all your images uh, of your patient's general dentition. It's a simple and really easy to acquire image which provides that general overview of a patient's dentition. It does have downsides though. It is prone to distortion. It is um, not a true one-to-one -one image. That is, it can be magnified due to the distance between the uh, source and the detector changing as it spins around the patient's head. Um, and it's restricted by superimposition because not uh, every parabolic arc matches every patient and it's not a one size fits all fix. So this is the way that an OPG works as it travels around the patient in a parabolic arc, it changes distance between the uh, source and the detector and that's how we get that magnification and distortion. Now my ideal OPG should look something like this. So you should have your TMJs at relatively the same height. You should have uh, it symmetrical about the midline. It should be a nice smile arc. That means that your patient haven't you haven't got the patient's head too high or too low, and the tongue up should be should be behind the um, hard palate, the roof of the patient's mouth. Get rid of that air gap, and you don't lose the definition of those anterior roots. And there should be a nice bold outline of the maxillary sinuses. When we are looking at a OPG, the things that you don't want to see are things that look a little bit like this. I'll just zoom this up a little bit. Are you still able to see that when I've opened it up like that? Uh, no, Tina, it's a black box again, so take the black. Okay, yeah. There we go. Okay, sorry. 
So um, with this patient here, the main issue is that um, there's a little bit of, uh, it's not symmetrical about the midline. So we know that because one side of the mandible is larger than the other side. So there's magnification and foreshortening. Also, um, the patient isn't standing up straight because this is the C-spine superimposed over the anteriors of the patient's anterior teeth. Um, this is also base of skull just here. Um, so the pin, patient's a little bit chin high. And the other issue may also be there's a canine laser on most machines. Uh, if it's not placed over the canine, it allow the that laser tells the, the machine how it wants to swing around the patient. If you've got it in the wrong spot, it can either be a large, too large a parabolic arc or to smaller parabolic arc and leaving um, those anteriors out of the focal trough. With this patient here, um, they've left jewelry on. Also, they aren't standing up straight because the anteriors uh, um, have the C-spine superimposed over that. And with this image, um, the patient is not symmetrical about the midline. One side of the face is more forward than the other. The left is the left is more forward than the right. Uh, this one is a little bit chin high and also the tongue isn't to the roof of the mouth. So we've got this, this is an example of what it looks like when you've got a big air gap over the top of the anteriors. So then you start to lose the image. Um, this is why it's important to have that tongue up flat against the hard palate. And this image here just shows that it's a little bit chin high for this patient. You're starting to get a frowny image. What you're trying to do is line up the inferior orbital margin, which you can see up here, with the external auditory meatus, which is just over here. This is your mastoid part of the mastoid air cells, and the exterior external auditory meatus should be about here, so your ear hole. That line should be parallel to the floor, and that should give you a nice smiley OPG with a slight curve on it. When we're looking at your ideal lateral ceph, what we want to be looking for is that your ruler is on nasion. The ears, are, the ear rods are in the ear hole. Your frankfurt plane should be parallel to the floor. So the external auditory meatus to the inferior orbital margin, that line there should be parallel to the floor. And the patient should be in their natural posture. So not slouching down, not stretching out, but much like Dr. V said, where the patient is looking as far ahead into the distance as possible. The patient should also be in their natural bite and their lips together and relaxed, much like when you're taking your uh, photo records. The reason why this is important is not necessarily just to do cephalometric tracings, but it's also so that in the future, it's easy to compare your cephs when you put them up against one another. And it's also really great to be having a look at the adenoids, the palatine tonsils, um, and any of the airways on the patient. Here's an example of what adenoidal hypertrophy looks like. As you can see, there's quite an outline there. And in the future, if you're seeing your patients regularly, you can see this is the same patient here. And over the years, you can see the changes in her uh, airways. And it's much easier to monitor any changes or if there haven't been any changes in this case where she's still got quite a large enlarged tonsils down the bottom here. Adenoids have um, uh, gone down just a little bit, but the tonsils are still quite enlarged. So I'll just quickly mention cone beam CT as you do refer off for these things. And I am going to put up a little bit of information about where you can find how to best answer patients' questions regarding radiation and CBVT. Um, CBCT takes a one-to-one -one volume of patient's data, um, allowing you to take accurate measurements of any sorts of changes in the patient's uh, root resorption, any impacted threes, um, impacted eights, and any changes in the future. 
It's not good for the differentiation of soft tissue due to the use of low energy radiation, but this is overcome with the use of conventional CT and MRI. Um, so what does make it different to a traditional CT is that it uses a cone-shaped beam and takes multiple cephalometric images on a flat panel detector as it spins around the patient's head. Whereas with traditional CT, we use a fan beam, which is quite like tightly collimated. And as the patient passes through the beam in a spiral fashion, uh, it adds the slices to together to create a volume of data. Whereas with cone beam, we add the images together to create a volume, which we then slice up. So they're the opposite to one another. So what about radiation and dose? There are lots of different forms of radiation that we get. So when you're explaining to patients, it's quite normal to get natural radiation every day. And I find the best way to explain the amount of radiation they get for an OPG is it's around about three days background radiation, uh, which is of them walking around every day. Uh, the other way you can explain it is that, uh, for example, a cone beam, is 0 0.1 millisieverts. We get 1.5 millisieverts in Australia. So 0 0.1 millisieverts for a comb beam is around about three weeks background radiation. All these doses come from the Australian Radiation Protection and Nuclear Safety Agency, and I'll be placing those links up in a moment. And the ways that you can reduce your dose is prepping your patient for any sorts of X-ray images and give them clear instructions. Watch your exposure factor, factors, they're usually set by your manufacturer, and also picking your right field of view. With some of your OPGs, you'll have a child setting. The child setting will actually use a smaller field of view and cut down a little bit and take off your TMJs. That's good for everyone up to about nine or 10, but if you've got quite a large patient, just make sure you move it up to the adult setting. It should hold the smaller child exposure but it'll just open up your field of view a bit more so that you don't miss out on those TMJs. Okay, and with your questions of, from patients about radiation, don't dismiss them, but explain how clinically it's more of a benefit to take these images than the small risk associated with it. Um, you can explain the amount of radiation in comparison to an OPG scan or another bite wing. Um, so a bite wing, two bite wings or three bite wings would be pretty close to an OPG nowadays. Um, and you can also explain that you wouldn't want to carry out any treatment without actually having an OPG prior to this because you're not quite, it isn't a, you need you have a valid clinical reason by doing orthodontic treatment in order to be able to do this. One of the main questions I do get though, is should a patient wear a gown for extra oral imaging? According to our Panza, no. Uh, one of the reasons why is this image here where you're starting to get artifact from the lead gown um, and making the image uh, not usable. In order to properly wear a thyroid guard, it is going to impact on your image and secondly, the beam passes from the back of the head to the front of the head, so it actually lands on the inside of the thyroid collar and the scatter then bounces back through the patient's soft tissue. So I will post this in just a second, but places to find more information on radiation um, is understanding radiation um, section on the Arpanza website. There's a guide for medical imaging, which is a great handout, which explains in your lifetime risk um, what that one x-ray adds to your lifetime risk of having um, a cancer-induced event by that radiation. Um, there's also a code of practice for safety, uh, of practice and safety guide for radiation protection in dentistry. That's really good to find things for your staff, uh, particularly pregnant staff. Uh, also your responsibilities regarding anyone with pregnancy, uh, how you need to look after your lead gowns if you have any in your practice. Uh, and any information on how often you need to have your machine checked. And the, uh, another place to find it is information for dentists referring children for CBCT. The government brought about in 2012 a healthcare directive um, regarding reducing dose for patients in CT. Um, CT. CBCT falls under CT codes in Medicare, so CBCT was also included in this. Uh, 
I'll probably hand back to you now, Dr. Katyal. Are you? Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Tina, that was great. Can you just show your details if someone wants to get in touch with you sure. about radiation, radiation safety, um, if they're having trouble with the images or reporting? So can you pop up yep. the details? I'll just pop it up right now. Um, and, guys, we have a Facebook group called Boss. It's a closed group. Tina is there. or the, uh, Tina's just posted her mobile number to the room and um, and her email. So if you have um, any questions, email her directly. She's fantastic. She'll get back to you. But also she's part of our closed Facebook group. So she's posted this information previously, and you can actually search her name, and you'll find out everything she's posted before.